awesome. Well, guys, we're going to just take a few minutes and uh, wrap up our time together. We are going to uh, conclude our evening tonight with, with communion together, but we're actually just this evening entering into a new series that we're calling The Son of Man. And it's going to be a profound time together. Did you know that Jesus had so many titles uh, given to his life? Can, can I hear a few from you? What would be a title of Jesus? The Word of God, King of Kings, Prince of Peace. Say again. Bread of Heaven. Emmanuel. The Alpha and the Omega, right? There's so many titles of Jesus in the Word of the Lord. But did you know that his favorite title that he himself referred to himself as was the Son of Man? The Son of Man. So this is a really powerful concept that we're going to look into and just dive in a little bit, and, and I want to take it through the angle of, of the gospel and what God is doing to transform people, and we're going to look into uh, the life of Zacchaeus. I've actually never preached on Zacchaeus before, ever in 20 years, 20 plus years, so I want to just dive into that a little bit, and it's found actually in Luke chapter 19. We're just going to look at verse 10 as we launch off here, because you're going to see this title of Jesus um, in this story, which is important. And we're going to understand why it's important here in just a minute as we make ourselves our way through this text. But look what it says in chapter 19, verse 10. And this is Jesus speaking. He says, for the Son of Man, there it is, his favorite reference of him to himself, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Have you ever gone to a restaurant and left your wallet in the booth where you were sitting, anybody else besides me? Come on, somebody. I, I've done it so many, or my phone, you know, and you're just, when you realize you're in the car and you're driving home and you're like, oh my God, like, Wendy, I freak her out all the time. Like, I get in the car and I'm always like pat, patting my, my pants. Oh my gosh, my wallet's there. Thank you, Jesus, or my phone, you know. But I'm so thankful as we make our way back to the restaurant that they have what's called the lost and found, Right? And you're thankful even more when what was lost actually has made its way into what has been found, right? And, there's, and it depends on what you lost, um, how valuable that piece or item is, whether it's a ring or your, your wallet or, you know, because for me, the wallet's not that big of a thing because I don't carry that much cash. Come on, somebody. Cash poor. Can I get an amen? But, you know, just changing the credit cards takes years off of your life. For real. Just that. Just having to call these companies and get a new car. And then it's worse because then you got to reconnect that to all your bills that you have on reoccurring payment, right? But that, there's, there's tremendous value. But we, I remember for years we had a lost and found in our other building of stuff. And, man, there was so many, I thought, valuable items that just stayed in that place, right? There was Bibles, guys, like the word of the Lord that someone had that they just forgot in church and just never even bothered, you know, going trying to find it again. Come on, what was, you know, just random stuff like that. You know, there's cups, um, glasses. I have many of these items now in my possession, okay? <laughs> They've been found because I saw value in them, right? But, but Jesus, as the Son of Man, his passion and the contribution that he made to human history was a sensitivity to the Father to see those ones that were being highlighted and to pursue them with the love of God. There's a uniqueness, though, to the culture and how he does this that I want us to learn just briefly tonight. And it comes uh, from the words of a song of my, my favorite prophetic <laughs> poet-writer, um, named Jason Upton. Here's what he says of Jesus, of the Son of Man. He says, many men are brave and many men are strong, but few men have I ever seen, listen to this, who fight for who's right and fight for who's wrong, who fight for the friend and the thief. The Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. 
because he sees value in the friend and he sees value in the thief. So here Zacchaeus is positioned for a moment of encounter, of transformation. It says in verse 1 of chapter 19 that Jesus was entering and passing through Jericho, and there's this man named Zacchaeus, verse 2, who was a chief tax collector, and it says he was rich. How do you think he got rich? He was a thief. He took off the top. There was total permission to do this. And he was collecting taxes, we know contextually, for the Roman Empire who the Jews hated, right? And so he, he wasn't a friend of his fellow countrymen at all because they looked at him as someone who was basically all messed up, caught up in the system, and betraying everything that they were about. But it's interesting, verse 3 isn't this, there's this verse that says that he, talking about the Father, has put eternity in our hearts. Every single, did you know this? He didn't just put that in you and my heart. He's put it in every single person that has ever lived. This, this sense that there's more to life than we realize. It's not just about living and dying. There's a much broader purpose, and I really pray, man, I, I was feeling this tonight just in worship. I'm praying that we would just awaken to the reality of what life really is about and the significance of the moment that we have with every breath that we breathe to bring contribution and value to the world by looking at those who God is highlighting and going after them because God wants to seek and save them because they have value. It says in verse 3 that he sought to see who Jesus was. But he couldn't because of the crowd. There's some mention of his stature here. I know there's this little Bible song about Zacchaeus, you know, this wee little man. I, I never sung that because I wasn't in church when I was a kid. Can I get an amen? <laughs> but the point is, is that he was buried within the, the, the swarm of humanity. And probably more than him not being able to see Jesus, he probably didn't feel seen himself, to be honest. And he was just kind of caught up in that. But something in him was like, I've got to put my eyes on this one that's making his way into town. So he climbs up into this sycamore tree. And I, I just want to throw this out. Like Juan says, we're not building anything, but there's, I'm telling you, what, what we are doing is saying yes to, to a, a, a love just wave that is coming towards us. And sometimes that requires us to get up out of where we are and climb up higher to get our eyes on this one Jesus as he begins to wake it, make his way into our space. There's, so, there's nothing wrong. I think that sometimes we just sit and we just stay subdued in the crowd of humanity, in, in the swirl of culture that just drowns us out and makes us so feel unseen. And he climbs up into this tree. And Jesus, it says in verse 5, uh, came to this place. He looks up and he sees this one. And he says, get down here. And look at these words. This is powerful. He says, for today I must stay at your house. Today. Like, I'm going to your house. Like, this is what's going to happen. Look at the response of the religious crowd. Okay? It says when they, in verse 7, when they saw it, they all. Everybody say all. all. They all. All of his followers. They didn't get it. They complained because he was going to be a guest with this sinner. You know, sometimes when we think we're friends with Jesus, we're actually the very thief <laughs> that needs love and redemption. This was a moment where they're like, he's like, man, he could have probably corrected him here. He's like, y'all, how much longer do I need to be with you? Like, this is what the Son of Man has come to do. To see value in human beings. That religion doesn't see any value because we sit in the place of hypocrisy and project what's actually, go, what's actually going on in our own hearts. It has nothing to do with the other person. He says, I'm going to your house. And they all complained. And I don't know if we 
we grasp the significance. There, I was at a, um, a funeral the other day. There was a, a couple that led a home fellowship for us for years up in Boynton Beach, the Sconhaus, Peter and Lorraine Sconhaus. And he just passed away after a 14-year battle with liver disease. And we were sitting, you know, I think there's something beautiful about going to these celebrations of life because it reminds us what is really important. Um, even Hector said it this morning. He said, like, what do you want to be remembered for? And there was this, this young man who got up to share, and he said when he was 13 years old, his father was killed in an automobile accident. He said it was tragic for him as, as a young man. And then he said the next year, his own mother left him alone. Left him. 14 years old. And you know what he said? He said, I was over at Peter's house because he was friends with Peter's son. And Peter could sense, he could see him in this moment. He didn't ignore what was going on. He could see what was happening. He was up in the sycamore tree, if you will. And he could see the distress on this young man. And he said, hey, why don't you just stay with us? I was like, what do you mean? He said, we got an extra bedroom right here. Why don't you just become a part of our family? You already are. Anyhow, we've had you over many times. You've hung out here nights and different times. And this young man, you know what he said? It broke me. He said, that changed my life. Changed one act of love, welcoming somebody who feels unseen to come into our house, them to come into ours. And so Zacchaeus in verse 8, he responds and he says, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. If I've taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I'll restore it fourfold. It's not about the, 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 the necessarily the, the jot and the tittle of like what he did necessarily, but you can see the movement on his heart because of love. Because of love. Like one act of love. Do we understand? Like towards a thief. Changes him instantly in this moment. And look what he says. Look what Jesus says in verse 9. I wish I had time to talk about this more, but I don't. He said to him, today salvation has come to this house, the place where you live. Check this out. Because, talking about Zacchaeus, because he also is a son of Abraham. We know that this whole thing began with one person that heard the Lord, followed his voice, trusted in the Father, even though he didn't know where he was going, that set something in motion that is still at work today, and that's the reason why we're sitting in this room. Abraham was the first, in essence, son of man that followed Jesus in his life, and he was the father of this nation that we're a part of, called spiritual Israel, if you will. It's beautiful. Jew and Gentile merged into one new man, the church. He was the son of Abraham. And he says, for the Son of Man, verse 10, came to seek and save that which was lost. Can you, I don't know, see, can you see here? Can you, no? There he is. If you'd come back up. I want to conclude, we have, if you, if you don't have one of these, we're going to take communion together. We have some up here. And by the way, you've got to push down on the thing. It will break, it'll make a click, and then you'll be able to get into this. Um, you know. you know, it just takes one person to set something into motion. It took Abraham that, to set something into motion, and then it took Jesus to do that. He was the firstborn of what? Many brothers and sisters, sons and daughters, wasn't he? So he came as the son of man. Because if you, if you look, the, the other title that's big is, is the son of God, right? His divinity. But he gave up 
that divinity and took on flesh and blood, came to this earth as one to seek and save that which was lost, humanity that was in its broken state. And so there's three things that I want to just conclude with that he gave his heart to that set the stage for us to give our hearts to. And it was the eternal foundations that will never end, that can never be taken away, that moth and rust can never corrupt, and it's faith, hope, and love. And I want to just cover those quickly, and then we're going to take communion together. Faith. Being fully convinced. Think of Zacchaeus. That nothing can separate us from the Father's love. Nothing. The word faith is the Greek word pytho, which means divine persuasion, where you're convinced of this truth. Because see, that's what happened in Zacchaeus' heart that day. He probably thought, there's no way that the Father will love me because of what I've done. But something happened in an action of love from Jesus that set something in motion in another person's life. divine persuasion. We know in Romans 8, 38, 39, he talks about, for I'm persuaded, he says, Paul, that neither death nor life, angels or principalities, powers, and he goes on and on, nor height nor death, nothing shall be able to separate me from the love of God. Can we say that? Because this is what Jesus modeled in his life. And he had an intimacy with the Father that, that now extended as an intimacy opener to other people's hearts. This is what God wants to do through us. Hope. Think about this with Zacchaeus as well and then reference it to your own heart as well. It's the promise that the eternal life of the Father would reside in us. This is what hope is. Christ in you. So if faith is divine persuasion, this is divine manifestation. Think about that. God now not only resided in Jesus through faith and hope, but he resides in us. Hebrews 10, 23, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful the confession of our hope God I believe nothing can keep you at a distance from me nothing can separate me from your love your word the logos the divine manifestation of the essence of the father has come and we have seen him and beheld him beheld the only begotten son of the father i am persuaded that your love is real come in to my heart consume me with everything that you are and the last one is love agape you know what that is? That's the divine expression. So we have the divine persuasion over our hearts through faith. We have the divine manifestation over our lives through hope. And we have the divine expression of the agape love of God. It's a love without agenda. You know what we've been conditioned as I close to understand what love is? Love is always about in this culture what someone's trying to get from you. Did you know that? That's why the love of many grows cold, because they start to lose trust in humanity. I watched this interview of this guy down in Miami. He's like, been married. he was married like five or six times, had many people after that. He's like, man, I'm done with that. I'm just, I'm just going to take care of dogs. You know, that's what he said, because dogs, they love. They're unconditional love. I'm like, makes sense to me, you know, just the way people are. Right, But God wants us to get to a place where we have a source of love that doesn't have an agenda flowing through our hearts. God has no agenda for you. Do you know, this, may, this, this isn't 
heresy, but Jesus didn't come to like tick the boxes on, on the number of salvations he was going to see with his life. Did you know that? He just came to love on people. And the chips fell where they were, where they, how they fell. He had no agenda other than to know the Father, to let hope reside on the inside of him, the essence of God, and then to give away the divine expression or essence of the nature of God. So this is where servanthood, someone yelled, I think it was Stephen yelled out servanthood because Mark 10, we're talking about greatness. I want you to take your communion cups out because they're talking about greatness. <laughs> Who's going to sit at your right hand and left? They're, they're, their motivations were totally off. He's like, you guys don't even know what you're asking here. The culture of this world, people in those pursuits, they lord over other people's hearts. And he said, it shall not be so among you. I mean, this is why when Jesus took that base in the towel and began to wash his disciples' feet, they're like, they're telling them to stop. They didn't understand this kind of love. But in Mark 10, verse 43, it says, So you shall not be it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever desires to be first shall be the slave of all. Here it is, another reference. Verse 45, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to give his life as a ransom for many. No greater love is this than to lay down your life for who? A friend. Thief, thief, thief. That's how we see it. And he's like, friend, friend, friend. Did you know that? Humanity has found favor with God because of Christ. We see through our lenses of hypocrisy and projection when God sees friends. So when we take of the broken body, and mine is literally broken because I just crumbled it in my hand with that power move on the, on the pulpit. Amen. He says, when you eat this, do it often in remembrance of me, how I'm different. We forget the goodness of Jesus, the Son of Man, who totally relates to our lives. He's not disconnected at all. Could we take and eat and see? Blood was spilled. Redemption was won. Path was made. Sorry, could you open this one with this? Yeah, Trig, thank you. Did you drink out of this one? Not yet? Okay. You know those one of those those people that don't like to drink after somebody else? That's me. Come on. Never. I can't do it. Lord, we remember the sacrifice of your blood. You lived a perfect life. Think about this, guys. A perfect life, yet he was a friend of sinners. And accused. (laughs) Accused of the most horrific, horrendous things, yet he was righteous, pure, holy, perfection, as the Son of Man. Blameless. drink of the pure sacrifice of your love for us, Lord, and we remember tonight. In Jesus' name. Could you stand with me? There's this um, this cool place. You can just come stand up. There's this cool place I was reading. We'll jump into some of this in the days to come, but Elijah, the prophet in the Old Testament, he was referred to as well as the Son of Man. It was like, you know, like with so many prophetic figures, it's like a it's like a projection, it's a glimpse for us to see into what's coming in the future for the New Testament church. 
He was the firstborn. We are following in his way. He is making us like him. He resides on the inside of us. It's potent. The kingdom of heaven is potent. It it infuses. It's like leaven. It, It gets into every single space. We just conclude with this. Father, would you come and continue your work in us? Help us to see. Lord, let us not boast in our bravery. Let us not boast in our strength. Let us not just be for who is right, but God, help us to be for who is wrong. Help us to be one who seeks out friends and thieves. Change this city, Lord. Come on, pray with me. Change this nation. Change the world. Break through in humanity with the power of faith hope, and love. Divine persuasion, divine manifestation, and divine expression through your body. You are the head. We couldn't have done any of it without you setting the stage for the greatest move of God in human history. If you believe that, would you put your hand up and say, Lord, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of the greatest move in human history. Let our epitaph, if you would show so tarry, bear the words off people's lips, so-and-so, fill your name in there, changed my life. Give the Lord a hand for his goodness. So just be so good. Amen, guys. You are dismissed. We'll see you next Saturday. If you want to hang, I'm sure he'll just play for a little bit. But God bless you guys. If you have your children, go pick them up and give the kids.